Okay, um, welcome everyone to the second session on the data engineering track on Monday. Um, next up, we have Hong Yue from Apple to tell us about um, Iceberg Catalog as a service. Thank you. Um, I think the data engineering birds of feather sounds interesting. That's something I want to give it a try. So before we start, I want to share some fun facts about Halifax. It's the third day of the conference. I'm sure everyone's a bit tired. So um, as far as I know, I think in back in 1912, there was a RM, RMS Titanic, and later on gets to a movie. The Titanic actually sunk somewhere near the Halifax, and uh, um, I think Halifax is the largest city nearby, so they send out a lot of crews to get to the rescue and take a lot of bodies back. There's a nearby gravesite. Um, it's a titan. It's marble. It's labeled as a Titanic gravesite. So it's a tourist attractions. I'll probably pay them a visit before I head back from the Halifax. So start. <laughs> Hey everyone, um, today I'm really excited to share this talk with you, Iceberg Catalog as a Service. Before we start, I want to introduce a little bit about myself. This is Hong Yue from Apples, and I contribute some of the code to the Apache Iceberg project. My exposure with the Apache started back in 2021, where I have an opportunity to contribute my first patch to the Iceberg project, and that journey never stopped. So it's really honored to be here today, as this is the first Apache Con I have ever attended and give a talk on. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that I have some colleagues, Raj and Hydros, who was originally part of this talk, but they cannot make it here due to the visa issues. So today I plan to go through the following points. Start with the Apache Iceberg projects and understand what's the catalog mean in the iceberg. And then we'll take a little bit detour to the high meta store to understand its foundation roles here. Next, I'll introduce the new enhancement and features we have in the REST catalog. Lastly, I'll do some comparison to see what's the advantage and what kind of limitation do we have when we choosing the catalogs. So let's start with uh, Iceberg project. Uh, to those who is not familiar with this project, it's the open table format designed for the analytical data sets. And when I initially read this description on the website, I was wondering what's that? It's probably another warehousing systems. And the one we are familiar with, you can use in SQL to insert some data and retrieve it later. So, but Iceberg really stands out from this is that it's very capable to handle the data at scales. It can easily manage a terabytes or petabytes of data and still answer a lot of queries in very fast results, like seconds. The secret sauce is that they have uh, this uh, metadata layouts and it can aggressively skip in the files on the read. So instead of reading entire tables, they can read subset of tables which are only necessary to answer the queries. So I know some of you might have this question in mind. I'm wondering if you can raise your hand if you don't know what's the meaning of the iceberg in the project names. Okay, I guess I can offer my interpretation of that. So for iceberg, it's, it's kind of similar. They have a very complex or hier hierarchical metadata structures. So, uh, but that doesn't expose to user directly. User can still use the SQLs or some other interface to read and write data. They don't need to know all these metadata structures. So it's kind of analogous to the iceberg you saw on the open oceans. They're floating on the oceans, but there's a bigger part of it below the surface. I know earlier on the Saturday, there's uh, another talk about iceberg architecture deep dive, and the deep anchor talk about uh, the Nest the structure of their metadata. I'm not going to repeat it here today. My focus today is on the catalog, which in my words, it's actually the tip of the iceberg. So catalog, what exactly is catalog? I was trying to find its definition on the Wikipedias, and it's such a widely adopted word. So it has to divide its usage under four different categories. There is a catalog in the technology, in the science, in the sales, and in the arts. But for me, under this context, uh, catalog just helped me answer those two questions. Where are all of my tables? 
And now how can I access them safely? I put safely in the bracket because often they omitted, uh, because it provides this uh, ACID guarantees, which is not standard in any of the um, warehouse offering today. So ACID here stand for the atomicity, uh, consistency, and uh, isolation durabilities. It actually doesn't surprise users when they're trying to use the iceberg tables for rewrite, re rename their columns, do the schema evolution, partition evolutions. So essentially, I believe in the catalog, uh, this help provide us the, with uh, table discoveries, the transaction support, and the managed concurrencies. So next, we'll look into what kind of catalog option do we have in the Apache Iceberg project. So we'll start with this uh, Hive catalog. That's the first catalog available in the Apache Iceberg project when they donate this to the Apache Software Foundations. It is donated to solve some of the shortcomings of the Hive tables. And then later on, when we have more adoption on the iceberg, the community contributes the following catalogs. Start with uh, this uh, uh, Hadoop catalog. It manages path-based table in the Hadoop file systems. It's pretty good for testing the waters, but generally, we don't recommend this for the production use. And later on, in the 2021, we have this uh, new GDBC con uh, catalogs. Uh, using the Java database connectors to persist all these tables and metadata pointers in external SQL tables. It's a kind of similar ideas where we have such SQL tables in the high meta stores, but this one has much simple schemas. And lastly, we have our REST catalog. It's a new REST endpoint which we can serve this uh, catalog request over HTTPs. So if you don't want to host your own catalogs, there's a, a lot of other catalogs with vendor supports. And if you're expert, you also have the opportunity to build your own catalogs as long as you follow the iceberg um, catalog interface. So also I was wondering, uh, for many of you with uh, iceberg experience, do you use the Hive catalog in the past? Can you raise a hand? Okay, I do see some usage of a Hive catalog. Next, I'm probably gonna dive deep into the Hive catalogs as this is the most popular choice in the Iceberg open source community. So Hive was introduced back in 2009 by the Facebook Infra team. It's aimed to provide a warehousing solution over the MapReduce framework. In its original tables, data in the Hive was modeled by the tables, partition, and the buckets. The Hive Metastore is included as a system catalog to bookkeep all the relevant metadata. In the past, uh, we saw many of the now iceberg users have their background in the Hive and then transition their tables from Hive to iceberg format. So one of the benefit of region catalogs when, during the migration is that single catalog can serve both Hive and iceberg tables. So all of this metadata doesn't need to change. And the uh, iceberg community have a lot of uh, functionality or store procedure to help them to simplify this migration process. They can start by migrating or experimenting some table in the iceberg, and then later on, they can permanently migrate this to the iceberg format. So the biggest problem we saw of using the Hive catalog for iceberg is because of the locking problems. As in the iceberg, when we commit data or metadata change, we will have these uh, metadata files and commit this process, we do the atomic swap of these metadata pointers in the catalogs. So when, for that to happen in the Hive catalog, there's actually four steps. First, the Hive client needs to secure table level logs and then get a table and latest metadata pointers. Then we do the swap to put the new metadata pointer and update some of the table properties. Lastly, we need to unlock and then release this operation for others this following error message and exception might be a little bit familiar to some of you when things go unplanned. From time to time, we see there is a runtime failure on the client side where a process holding the log gets terminated or ter uh, preempt so that the unlock cannot be issued. Or worse can happen on the server side when high meta stores are overwhelmed. They're unable to process this uh, unlock request in timely fashions, either of which will leave uh, locks often on the tables, 
and this orphan lock will prevent other subsequent changes. And the worst part is the failure are a little bit hard to reproduce. They tend to happen around the same times and require external intervention to resolve them. So just want to share a little bit more. In the hives, the table level locks are actually modeled at, in its own dedicated tables. So in order to unlock those orphan tables, someone has to call these unlock APIs. Um, so many of the uh, user might not know that there is actually one flag on, can be configured on the head matter side to do the automatic house clean jobs. So if the locks already after its timeout, it can be dropped automatically. But many of the iceberg user might not be aware of that flag even exists. Iceberg community already spent many of the hours trying to help with these prevailing lock problems. There is a nine dedicated iceberg catalog properties you can config the locking behavior of your uh, Hive catalogs. For example, what's your lock creation timeout and uh, how long you check for the uh, lock acquisition durations and how long you check for the lock heartbeat. The Hive PMC or Iceberg Committers, Peter varies, spend many hours and multiple PRs trying to fix the problem by pro pro providing us with uh, lock-free implementations. Uh, I think the problem with that is this fix actually involves multiple projects. Like we have to fix the problem in the hive. And also we need to upgrade all of the dependency in the, uh, in the iceberg, which will commit to these hive catalogs. <laughs> Lastly, we need to make sure that all the properties are right. If not, I think there is some risk of corrupting your tables. And we all know that dependency upgrades in the enterprise software is not a small task especially when Hive and Hadoop dependencies involved in the equations. And also, um, in the open source Hive, we have some problem to upgrade them out of JDK 8 when security wants us all move to the JDK 11, 17. And in my honest opinions, I think using the Hive Meta Store to catalog iceberg table is a such an overkill. Last time I checked in the Hive catalog, in order to function, um, we need to create 75 internal tables, but Iceberg used less than five of them. So I think now we're just start to think about if we can do this in other directions. That brings us to the REST catalog. Uh, Iceberg REST catalog is a new solution where we delegate catalog responsibility to a REST server. So the process engine such as Trino, Spark, and Flink here, they can send HTTP requests to the REST endpoint and get their desired response back. This opens many doors of integration on the server side. As, all, as we all familiar with this the fundamental theory of uh, software engineering, we can solve any problem by introducing an extra level of indirection. So the REST server here is our new indirection to hide all the implementation detail of the iceberg. I don't imagine users need to know all these details about the, how Iceberg transact its transactions. So this presents us an opportunity to hide all of the infra headache behind the scene and then let users to focus on their data problems and improve their overall user experience. So I'll start by listing all the APIs available on the REST server side, where I divide them into five different groups to highlight some of the unique features. In the iceberg world, all of the tables are organized by the namespace, so it's not a surprise to see we have set of APIs for all the namespace. And secondly, if we look at these configuration APIs, this provides us the ability to actually override or enforce some of the table behavior for all of them created on the catalog. For example, I, I think this can be useful as a platform you want to de default and enforce some behaviors. One thing can be, uh, enable the object storage for all of your tables. This is particularly true if your tables are hosted on the uh, cloud, like S3, object storage. We usually have this in place because add a hash parameter to all of the file paths. This will prevent the uh, uh, throttling and to distribute all files more evenly. And access control is certainly a hot topic in the enterprise. Uh, this new authorization API, adding the missing support, we can integrate this at the catalog levels. We can now have the fine-grained access controls 
And then we can limit who can actually read the data. If you are downstream data consumers, you can read data that makes sense. If you are table owners, that makes sense for you to update its schema to actually uh, change the table properties. And also, something we want to prevent is we don't want anyone with a uh, privilege to accidentally drop your production tables. So if we have a fine grain access control, is something um, just make everything simpler. Next, we have a table APIs. This offers some ability to rename a table, to register external table to the existing catalog on top of standard CRUD operations. While I list off the support API here, some of you might notice that uh, it, it is actually a deliberate choice to exclude the data trend from the catalog APIs. For example, if I want to read and write data into i tables, none of the API will show directly over here. So what happens is that um, when you actually want to get the data out of tables, there's a two parts in play. There's one at the catalog, and there's other part which has the iceberg library in the engine's code. So for example, if I want to read some data out of iceberg tables, the first step is for catalog to call the get table APIs to get its metadata pointers, and then engine will kick in to open these metadata files and then collect these two rows of results and return back. Similarly, when you want trying to insert some data, update, or delete data from iceberg tables, what happens is that engine will generate new metadata files, and then catalog will do the update table API to automatically swap that metadata pointers. Lastly, we have this metric APIs, which allow the engine to voluntarily send all this metric back to the catalog. So there is a one unified place we can actually collect and analyze off the iceberg usage. The interesting part is uh, iceberg open source community collectively designed all these APIs in an open API specifications, but they are not uh, available for the actual implementation of this. You cannot find this in the existing iceberg project. So this brings a really interesting choice when we think about how to choose the right catalogs. So when choosing between the catalogs, I'm evaluating them from four different angles. So extensibility, securities, functionality, and how easy we can adopt them. Uh, for the REST catalog, as I mentioned, right now we only have API definitions, but not implementations. This actually can be seen two ways. For some, I can see the argument where it's higher barrier to entry because you have to build and maintain your catalog over the time. But I would agree more on the other side, where this actually presents us with the opportunity to extend API at wells. You can apply a lot more customizations if the business justifies it. Both the REST server and client is no longer restricted to the Java anymore. This can be implemented in any language agnostic manner. And in contrast to Hive, where Kerberos is the only viable solution for the access control, the REST catalog actually presents a pluggable um, authorization interface so that um, we have much more OS workflow available in the enterprise world when it came to the REST. Functionality-wise, uh, next few slides, I will share you with example on why metric reports is a good example to show um, we can continuously build on top of these REST catalogs and have visibility into iceberg table was used allow us to optimize them at scale. And uh, lastly, as Iceberg REST catalog name suggests, it only supports Iceberg tables. So this has some implication where if the original catalog serving both Hive and the Iceberg requests, this cannot fully replace the needs until all of the table has been migrated from Hive to Iceberg tables. So this slide, I want to highlight the uh, ability to collect the iceberg scan and commit metrics on the REST server side and share some example why this can be quite useful. So iceberg track individual files in its metadata and commit is the last step to uh, ensure all the updates are atomic. So with the optimistic concurrency models, the commit process can actually be retried for multiple times if there's other concurrent write happening around the same time. So we all know debugging uh, concurrency problems are hard when things go unplanned. 
And uh, this new metric API can help us here by providing a holistic view on the server side. If we have all of the data points about who commit and what are they committing with. So if you're looking at the request body on the right hand side, which map to this SQL statement on the left hand side, you can see in the metrics, we have the data as about number of data files being added, total data file size, records, and also we have the attempts and the durations. Together with the metadata, we have this application ID and engine name. These can help us track down who's authoring this commit and how many times have they tried to do this. What kind of operation do we have? One thing that's not on this picture is this metadata also include iceberg version. So this will help us to understand what kind of iceberg version they are using. Maybe they are using something without this particular bug fix, and maybe upgrade the iceberg version will help them in this case. Uh, something else uh, I want to propose here is that I think the iceberg commit is actually a very interesting event to trigger the downstream evaluations. So um, I think everyone wants to use the iceberg table one fast query results. If that's an assumption, I think sometimes if we saw there's a append commit with thousand files, and maybe there's some opportunity we can compact them right after commit so that we have fewer and larger files. And when you query next time, the data will be, uh, there's a less amount of data file you need to open next time and we'll speed up the query results. And if you have uh, updates happening across the multiple files, across partitions, maybe we can cluster this manifest together. That's also going to help speed up your metadata queries. So I think uh, there's a lot of opportunity for us to take action based on the fact that we know there's new commit coming. Same thing happens to the scan metrics. When users are trying to read data from the iceberg tables, Engine will do the scan planning, and uh, they can also send this metric back to the catalogs to understand all of the read patterns. So in the previous slides, I insert five records distributed in five files so that each file will only have a one record. Right now, if I'm going to select data from the tables with the predicate where ID column has a value greater or equal to three, I get my results back. There's three rows. And I can also validate against my assumption that only three files need to be open. So in the request bodies, we can see number of manifests, a read, skipped, and also number of result data file. This is helpful because it helps me understand all the performance-related questions. If I query to send to iceberg, I want to know if the predicate is being pushed down properly. I can look at this and get my answers. And also, once we understand the root cause of a slow queries, we can apply the optimizations and then we can optimize them faster so that we can get faster results in future. So with all these features I talk about on the REST catalog side, the real challenge starts when we think about migrations. Um, our end goal is to have a REST catalog adopted for all of our iceberg use case and to reduce the friction during the migration process. The REST server is really just two parts, the APIs, which is serving the request, and also the backend, which delegate to the real catalog and fulfill the ask. So the migration, we also divide into two parts, the migration of a catalog and the migration of a backend. So start with a customer-facing change when we migrate from Hive to REST catalogs. First, we need to set up this new REST endpoint and delegate all the requests to the Hive catalog. This ensures that all of the metadata still stay the same. There is no change needs to be done on the user front. And the second step, we need to script the catalog configuration in the engines. For example, if users using the Spark, Trino, or Flink, they need to make sure all of the Spark configuration or Flink configuration need to be updated so that they can connect to this red endpoint instead of a high meta stores. And, uh, also, sometimes this also implies that we might need to upgrade the iceberg dependency within these engines. Luckily, I think in the latest release of the common engine like Spark, Trino, and Flink, they all have the right support to iceberg REST catalog now. Once we're done with all the customer-facing change on the catalog, we can think about our backend. The second part will shift the focus where we migrate the backend from the Hive to GDBCs transparently. So we start to prepare a new relational database 
and we can config REST server to connect to this GDBC backend. In the meantime, we can also expect that there's no user will directly connect to the high metastore directly. So we can lock down the network access so that only REST server is going to access this uh, high meta stores. The last step is actually we do the migration of the metadata. We will move all the tables and metadata pointer from Hive to the GDBCs. Consider, uh, and earlier I mentioned there is a one register table API which is available to register this to the uh, external table to the catalogs. We can use that. But one thing you need to call out here is that there are, the register table API are uh, migrate table by tables. There might be some of the implicit data dependency across tables. So imagine there's a standard ETL job by the users. I will read some data from the fact table A, and I join with all the dimension tables B and maybe more fact tables. I do some ETL process aggregations. Finally, I get results and then persist into some result tables. And this all happened in the, within the same session, like Spark or Trino. So during the migration, we want to make sure all of this unit work, uh, migrate get around the same time. So if you have some table migrate but not others, this might accidentally break the user workflows. Because the scope of this change, this can be actually achieved by one of two ways. One is for the REST server to migrate this on demand. If they say there's a table reference in the old catalog and they migrate them just in time. Or these can be um, driven by external process, which you do the group grouping first and then migrate them batch by batch. So uh, we want to try to reduce all the frictions on the uh, user front. Next slide, I'll talk some of the performance number we collected, and it's more evident now, why do we even think about migrate from high to GDBC backend? So the, in the figure here, um, the vertical axis highlights the aggregate 99 API latency. And you can see that Hive in the red colors uh, spending more time under all scenario, but it's noticeably more in the high concurrency setup. And when we're trying to look out why it's the reasons, Look like high backend spend more time trying to acquire their global unique log instead of processes transactions. When there's a multiple thread trying to grab the log around the same time. While JDBC here, they can consistently perform and handle requests around 300 milliseconds. And if we look a little bit deeper, the second graph here showing the latency breakdown by APIs. On the left hand side, we have the data definition related to APIs when you create or drop our tables. On the right hand side, we have a get and update tables for the data manipulations. So right hands are usually uh, much more frequently used if a table are long lived. The, the box chart I use here using a five number summary about a data set. It will highlight the spread and the skewness through their quartiles. I think the legend showed the median values. The number difference might seem uh, acceptable at first glance, but if you look at the uh, colored middle part, you can see the red one is much larger than the green one, which means the Hive actually suffer from these uh, long tail problems. Its slowest requests take much longer than GDBC to respond. So overall, I think GDBC have a much better throughput and handle, can handle more requests per second. During our benchmark process, we set up those two REST endpoints, each of which one core and four GB of memory per Kubernetes pod. And we horizontally scale this to three pods. And in the backend, API will delegate this request to Hive and GDBC uh, respectively. So also we want to ensure that um, we have the accurate results and minimize all the runtime variations so before we collect the numbers, we have a two round of warm up followed by four round of iterations. We aggregate results so that we take the average of iterations and to simulate all of the client requests and collecting the data points, we using the Apache JMeter as a reliable and uh, robust testing tools. Lastly, I want to highlight some of our contribution back to the open source community. As an early adopter of the Iceberg REST catalog, we face many challenges when we uh, do it, particularly around uh, the problem where um, 
we use an open API generator to generate all the server and client stuff. And there's a problem to map this uh, open API generate model back to uh, Iceberg uh, core models because they already exist before the open API spec. But I think those problems are um, okay. We believe this is the right direction going forward. And all the investment we did not only benefit us, but benefit the broader iceberg mm -hmm. communities. So I really appreciate all the help from the community to help review and propose the change to continuously integrate and uh, getting the rest catalog to the mature stage. The collective wisdom and the community commitment is what driving the force of the Apache iceberg project. This brings the last two of this uh, presentation. I hope my talk will leave some reason for you to think about iceberg rest catalogs. It's really my pleasure to share our lesson and experience with you guys. I'm, I'm ready for any questions. I think I have a question over here. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, the question is like, what kind of a high version do we use? Is a Hive 2, Hive 3, or Hive 4? Right now we're using Hive 3.1. Yes, for the HMS benchmark collect uh, data I collected. Do you want to go first? Yeah. Um, so you just mentioned Nestle as one of the catalog options. Uh, is that something you ruled out early on because it doesn't fit the use case or is it sort of like maybe it is just a null? I don't see any thoughts on it. Yeah, so the question is uh, in the early talks I mentioned about Nancy and what's the reason behind not uh, trying with the Nancy directions? Yes. Yes, yes. So I think uh, Nancy is also a popular uh, catalog choice. Uh, also offers some additional ability to do the branch and tag uh, at level higher than the iceberg. I think iceberg has uh, table levels, but Nancy are probably another level above the tables. So I think we also actually evaluate the use case uh, about using the Nancy's. Uh, I think the problem is that we want to apply a lot more customization around APIs. And I think we talk with Nancy people, they're also looking at the REST catalog very closely. So we're thinking about maybe we can uh, do some collaboration on that from, yeah. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. so that we can update the table as we have cached, and we have cached the metadata. Mm -hmm. The question is, is there something similar in the, the REST catalog? So I, I guess, uh, let, let me try to capture your question. I think your question is, in the high meta store, there is some ability to uh, have the event based on the table being updated. Is there any feature parity in the Iceberg REST catalogs? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, so I, I, I think uh, I haven't explored the um, high meta store events, uh, but I, I know there's other teams are using them. Um, so I think uh, the problem with um, our Hive operation is that we take this Hive directly from open source. We didn't invest too much into Hive meta store because we thought that would be the only use for the cataloging purpose. And the uh, REST catalog, I think it's getting more adoption. There's a lot of future building around this in the community. So that's where um, we spend more time trying to um, get our um, datas. And the other part is because Hive Metastore actually all this event is not specific to Iceberg table. They apply to Hive as well. And I think Hive is much, Hive table is much bigger beast because they, there are so many changes can happen, like on the partition levels or at the bucket levels. So I think uh, it's actually a little bit more than we want to tackle. That's why um, I'm more looking this at uh, iceberg format instead of a uh, high meta store. I, I hope this answer at least part of your question. Uh, I think uh, not completely like, uh, if let's say I want to be notified about this that a new table created mm -hmm. since the last time I checked, mm -hmm. is there some kind of API? Yeah, so I, I think 
the question is that if you want to check when it's the last time this uh, table gets modified, what's the option do we have, right? Uh, no, like not a specific table. Like mm. the new, is there any new table in the last few seconds? Is, if there's any new table created in the last few seconds, what kind of option do we have? Yeah, I, I think this will actually um, kind of close to what I mentioned. Earlier I mentioned about there can be event derived from the commit to the iceberg tables. But all of this uh, API lists uh, like a table lifecycle management, creation of tables, drop a, a deletion of tables, those can also generate events and you can take action based on that. So if we have a collection of events for all of the tables and there can be external process to build and take action both based on those events. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I guess you, you have another question. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess the question asking about if there's any working apples to work on the iceberg risk log to apply some questions. Actually, I think this is a very good point. Um, I think because we have a REST endpoint, we have a lot of ability to do the standard REST server did, like a cache and authentication authorizations. Caching is something we look at. Actually, at the iceberg level, there is already a mechanism to cache off the manifest. So, for example, if you need to read this table multiple times, you can cache this at catalog levels. And uh, uh, of the, the problem is that we realize sometimes um, your metadata kind of grow in size with your data. So, for example, if you have like a three, four million files, your metadata will be at a level of, uh, I'll say about 100-ish megabytes. So I think uh, we can, we already tried and I think we can try more to cache in this manifest, but just to watch out because as your data grow, your manifest gonna grow. And it probably works for most of a medium sized table, but for your super large world tables, I'm not sure how much you want to spend on caching of the manifest. The best practice, I think, is probably to get this uh, manifest rewritten so it's more evenly distributed of this manifest file. So like, you probably better to have a 10 manifest with 50 megabyte each instead of caching one with 500 megabytes. Yeah, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess the question is about the metric part. Is that metric submitted by the engine like uh, uh, Spark or Flink or is that uh, handled by other uh, clients, right? Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. So I think right now is uh, with the latest um, release of the support in the iceberg, I believe Spark and Flink both are submit this uh, scan metric and commit metrics back to REST catalog. So it's already in place. The, the the snippet I collected actually from one of the Spark submit. And uh, in other, like if you have a customer client connect to the REST catalog, you can also implement similar interface. But th those are already in place for the common engines. I think that's all the question I have. I'm also available outside if anyone wants to ask more.